So let's look now at just at the end, um, the veterinary care of wild animals. And this is again related to rehab, but just in a more specific veterinary sense now. A well-meaning member, member of the public brings you an injured pigeon. What should you do? Now this is, have you all, has anyone seen this happen? I'm sure if you have, you worked in practice, nodding away, um, or a squirrel or something, you know, various hedgehogs. Um, I found this nice picture of a pigeon and, and actually my, a friend of mine did actually hit a pigeon with her car and she took it to a vet, but she just kind of dumped it and walked out. <laughs> um, what should the vet do? Do you think vets have got any responsibilities to these sort of animals? Yeah? What was that? Do we have responsibilities to these animals? They're unknown, they're wild, but people are nodding, maybe limited responsibilities. What are the considerations? Well, first of all, this is that question, can you return the animal to full health? And that means so it can be released again and survive and not die of malnutrition or, or something. Do you have the skills to do it? You know, if it's a bird and you're not a, a you know, how do you fix a, an eagle's wing? You know, <laughs> haven't done that before, it's gonna be tricky. It's not routine stuff, um, obviously. How long will it take to do that? Are we actually familiar with the species? You'll be able to get help to do that, I suppose. Who will pay you? It's a bit of a horrible thing to say, but if you're going to be doing this a lot, then it's a relevant consideration. Is this your responsibility? What will happen once you release it? Will it actually survive? And this is a bit of a horrible point again, but there is no shortage of city pigeons. That doesn't mean that each pigeon has less of a right to life or anything, but really, it's hard to argue that we really that the loss of one pigeon is a huge, a huge harm to society, certainly, or to the well population. What are the arguments for treatment? Well, of course, often we have caused the problem. Again, this idea that we can compensate for human acts. So things like RTAs are what the, often you'll be brought animals that have been involved. Or, of course, people just find animals that are sick and bring them to you. And again, I think as some of you were alluding to there, you could argue that a vet should provide attention to any animal that's in distress, in an emergency, even if it's just to euthanise it just to put it out of its misery. And I think a lot that's what happens a lot. They say, oh yeah, we'll take care of it and just go in the back and, <laughs> and put it to sleep. Which is often, I mean, with wildlife, if, actually, if you can actually get near enough to pick it up, it's usually so ill that it is pretty near the end, I think, usually. People have argued that it's good publicity for you as a vet practice to say we treat wildlife and we have this great case of a, you know, perhaps a more exotic animal like an eagle or something or a badger that we helped and, and released. So that could be worth, that could be an incentive. And you could learn more, of course, about these animals and even things like certain diseases and so on. And you could argue that some vets will enjoy this challenge. It's a bit different, you know, a bit of a change from the norm. And you might feel pretty good if you manage to get this pigeon back to health and, and release it and feel like you've done a good thing, which is nice. Against treatment, though, there's many arguments. Again, do we know enough to be able to do this? Can we even feed it? You know, if you get a hedgehog in, you know, what do you feed a hedgehog? Where are we going to get the slugs? <laughs> you know, it's not straightforward. Although I think we eat dog food quite happily, apparently. Um, can we keep this animal? Do we have any facilities to keep this animal? Maybe we know a local wildlife centre we can hand it to, but if we don't, then we're going to struggle. And that's not just when it's pretty quiet just now, but when it recovers, it can become a bit more boisterous, a bit more difficult to handle, or even dangerous to handle. Could it pick up an infection in captivity that we could then, it could then transfer? That's another idea of preserving the population health by not preserving this individual. And of course, does it have good long-term prospects? Will it be able to return to the wild? If it had to remain in captivity, do you think there'd be an argument for doing that? So you could keep this, say you could save this pigeon, but it could never fly again. So it wouldn't really work, it wouldn't really survive in captivity in, in the wild or in the city. <laughs> do you think that would be okay to do that? Anyone got a view? You know? So saving. <laughs> yeah, so, so if, it was, if it was an endangered species, would you be more keen to, even though it would be kept in captivity, maybe you could give it to a zoo or something? Yeah. Okay, so it's just because a common regarding pigeon, less, less important. I think that's a difficult one, isn't it? Because again, can we really meet its needs in captivity? Maybe it'll have a great life, but maybe it won't. And is, have we really done that disservice by not putting it to sleep at this point? by actually keeping it alive. Again, if the animal has to remain in captivity, is this against its interest? Are we harming it somehow? And is the cost of long-term care feasible? Who's going to look after it? Maybe you know somebody that will, but otherwise, who's going to do that? Euthanasia could be the most humane action you can take, especially if you, if you suspect you can't meet the animal's needs, or no one can. And again, if we even if we do release it, we don't know what happens. 
that's not a reason not to try, but it's worth bearing in mind that even if we get as far as releasing what we believe to be a healthy animal, we're not really sure whether it's, it's going to make it. So I've just got a wee thing to finish on, a wee kind of um, case. Um, it's called, it's part of, from Everyday Ethics. Anyone seen Everyday Ethics? It's in In Practice magazine. It's at the back of In Practice every week, and it's a little column where every week there's a kind of ethical dilemma or an ethical kind of conundrum. So if you're interested in ethics, have a look. It's a really nice little column. It's everything, this, this is a, obviously a wildlife form, but it's all kinds of scenarios, large animal, small animal, exotics, inter-colleague issues, you name it, it's there. It's really nice little columns. One's about vet nursing and everything. Um, and each time, each week there's a little case that's like this. And then an ethicist or someone like myself will write a kind of analysis of the problem and maybe some advice of what you would do. Although sometimes you do have the ethical freedom to decide for yourself which course you will take, but we could give you some arguments for and against different courses of action. So here's one about a cetacean stranding. Uh, again, true story uh, from Scotland. You were called by the police early in the morning to a live stranding of a baby dolphin spotted by a crofter on the east coast of Scotland. You arrived to find a harbour porpoise partly beached in very calm water. The local press and a group of bystanders are present and keen for you to rescue the animal, which had apparently been sighted swimming in shallow water in the bay the previous evening. It has some recent comb-like skin lesions, which suggests an attack by a bottlenose dolphin, which does happen apparently, they get attacked by, by bottlenose dolphins, but appears in relatively good body condition. It responds with moderate vigour to your initial examination. How do you proceed? So, what are the options here? What could you do? Put it to sleep, yep. So call a specialist organisation and maybe get some advice, yep. There's another option. It's not a very nice one, but just do nothing. Just let it die naturally. Which is an option, I'm not defending it, but. Mm -hmm. It's not actually a baby, it's just they thought it was a baby dolphin, but it's actually a porpoise, which is a smaller type of... Yeah, okay, so it's not a baby. Yeah, it's not a baby. No, that's why it's in quotes, because the bystander, the people didn't know what it was. It looked like a small dolphin, but it's a porpoise. So you're saying maybe it would, it, would, it would survive? Yeah. So what, would you try and float it again? Would you do something there and then? No, but, but I think what the animals are not allowed is that if I wasn't experienced enough to do what I had to do, then I would definitely call someone on an agency that would help me out. Yeah, because yeah. they might say, listen, that's interesting before, that won't, it won't survive, or no, that'll be fine. It just needs a few months to recover, or a few weeks to recover in the right place. So exactly, so maybe we don't know enough, that's one of the big problems, and we don't know enough about the animal or the injuries or whatever. Now, sometimes it'll be a no-brainer. If it's really bad injuries, you're gonna go, right, we're just gonna stop. But the, the clue here is, yeah, it's in good body condition, so it's not been there for a long time, I guess, and it's moderate vigor suggests it's not completely a death's door. Okay, so maybe you would want to give somebody a call and see what you could do about that. Um, what about the fact that the bystanders are, are there? How does that affect the situation, if at all? Yeah. Putting it to sleep. So if you walk up to them and say, guys, I'm going to put it to sleep. <laughs> They're not going to like that. Even if that's the best outcome, even if, say you did know a bit about it, you thought this animal's not going to survive in the wild. There's nothing that can be, you know, it's not going to survive rehabilitation. It's not going to survive transport to the centre. So I'm going to do something, I'm going to, I'm going to put it to sleep. Then that's going to be a difficult call for you to make with these people and the local press there and so on. So that's, I think that's a tricky one. Um, they're all, they've probably named it by now and, you know, it's the emblem of the, of the village or something, you know. So they, they do invest more um, emotional value in this now, you know. So will somebody who brings you a, a pigeon that they've named or something and they've found and they'll, want, they'll phone you up, how's the pigeon getting on, you know suddenly care about this pigeon, not other pigeons, just that pigeon, because they're, they're, they're involved now. So that's worth mentioning with wildlife, that people, particularly if it's animals that like dolphins people like, um, people will get involved. So I think we, that's as far as we can go with that, we have to see what the expert advice was. I mean, I've just put down some relevant considerations in the next slide, so 
The analysis is there's three options. Try some sort of rehabilitation, which again, you may need advice to go down that road. Allow the animal to die naturally. Does anyone feel that's a good option? I think that we can do better than that. Bearing in mind, of course, if this had happened on some uh, remote beach, no one would ever have seen this poor boys, and it would just have died on the beach. But I guess now that we have seen it, the argument is that we do have a duty to it. As soon as we've been called to it, we have a duty to it, and that's not good enough. And of course, we can euthanise it, which may, of course, be a very good option in, in certain cases. As I was saying, the emotional value of this animal has now been influenced by the public and the bystanders that are there, and they will be less keen to accept euthanasia, even if that's the best outcome. We all, I think we all agree we've got some duty to the animal. Do you have a duty to the bystanders? No? You don't think it's about protecting them or helping them or anything? No? Okay, right, so don't go near it if it's <laughs> going to, yeah, fair enough. But you're not worried about their emotional well-being, hugely. No? <laughs> okay. I'm just putting it out there. I'm not saying you necessarily should be. If they're paying clients, perhaps a little more, but not as much in this situation. I guess we could argue we've got responsibility to avoid suffering, which is why we can't really do this one. Um, and what you'd ideally be looking for is some kind of collective decision. So if you did think it really was the best thing to, to euthanise, you would have to go and speak to the people and say, listen, I've had a look and explain your reasoning, explain how you get to the euthanasia place and make it seem like less of a bad outcome. It's still a sad outcome, but it's not the wrong outcome. And that's an important difference. Sad doesn't equal bad. That's an important difference. Um, Sure, no, maybe, maybe a collective decision is the wrong word. I mean, a collective agreement, maybe. Just get them on side is what I'm getting at. If you just go ahead and do it and don't even tell them what happened, then they're going to feel pretty miffed. And I think you at least owe them an explanation. You may not be moved on what you're going to do, but you, if you explain why you're doing it, then that can be very, very powerful. Same with any animal you want to put to sleep. You know, if you can explain the ethical basis of that decision, that your, your primary concern is quality of life, not quantity. Yeah, you can say, well, I'm interested in animal's welfare, the animal's suffering right now, and I can't do anything to end its suffering except put it to sleep. And that's my responsibility to, to end suffering. I've got responsibility to avoid animal suffering in this animal. So you can kind of go down that road, I think. But yeah, you don't have to do what they say. <laughs> Yes, potentially. Well, if you may argue that you do. I mean, you may think you're not. I mean, I think if you think you never have any duties towards people but only animals, you're not going to last long as a vet, right? Because people have interests particularly your clients have interest and you've got a whole bunch of professional responsibilities them not to lie to them, not to overcharge them, these sort of things. But I would say, personally, you've got some responsibility to these people just because they are, they've called you out, they're interested. Maybe if the animal's suffering very badly, you wouldn't delay long before you did anything about it. Or maybe you'd even do it and say, I'm sorry, very sorry you had to see that, or you know, I'm sorry that happened, but here's what I did. It. So that's maybe the best you can do. I think if you delayed for a long time to get their agreement, you might do the animal a disservice. So it's a balance, isn't it? animal first perhaps and then owners or then people but they don't have no interest in this because they basically if you, if you can be harmed by a situation you have an interest in a situation if this went badly according to them they might go home and go that was terrible that was really horrible and something better could have happened and that vet was awful and you know you can maybe do better than that in terms of the vet's professional reputation as well you know and again highlighting quality or quantity of life animals have two interests their quality of life and their quantity of life both are important, but we prioritise quality, okay? So we always put welfare first. In the, in the sense that we can't, if you keep an animal alive when its welfare is poor, we're not helping it, we're not giving it anything, we're just allowing it to suffer. So quantity only matters really when quality is okay. When quality is very poor, then quantity is actually not really as important. And this is the kind of discussion you could have with people and clients too, to explain why euthanasia is always, it can be a good outcome. And again, there's, again, this is a, just a, a website, um, there's a ruling back in 2009 saying that beached whales are to be put down now because there's been so little success in re, refloating them and things that they're just generally going to put them to sleep when they find them, if they can. 
very big wheels, it's very difficult to put them to sleep because of the amount of drug involved, but um, they can also do like shooting and things, they can mechanically do it. Um, and this is the idea that it's very, very difficult to do it. Um, there's a, a pilot whale stranding in, in Fife recently, I don't know if anyone heard about it. Some a couple of students from our, I don't know if anyone here went to help. A couple of our students that had the training, they can get training to go and be on standby. But apparently it's pretty horrific and they were in a kind of shingle beach, a lot of them had been cut by the shingle, there's blood everywhere and they managed to refloat a couple but it was pretty bad and pretty upsetting for everybody, they did their best but um, really it's not very easy to get this and it's a big animal, it can't really be put into a rehabilitation centre, the only thing you can do is try and get them back out and hope that they'll survive in, in the open ocean. So again this is the idea, quality first, always, quality of life first. So we've seen the ethical concerns around zoos centre on wild capture, primarily the quality of captive care and their value for conservation and education. Now I'm not saying that captive care is not good in zoos, I'm saying that it's variable and I'm saying that for some species it's particularly hard, even with the best intentions, to get it right and to meet all the needs. Environmental ethics tends to focus on preservation of life in general and biological systems. And this can be at odds with the welfare of individual animals, in breeding programmes or relocation things, as, as we saw. And there are arguments for and against human intervention to promote the welfare of wild animals. Something to do with how, how endangered the animal is or whether we've been involved in harming it initially. And you have to make individual decisions when faced with these situations, which is really a whole bunch of things to consider. We just looked at some of them there. Um, and really, can you get the animal back to a reasonable state to get back in the wild? If you can't, then euthanasia is probably looking like a better option. And just in a, a paper, if you're interested, um, out of JAVMA, which is quite a nice paper, and that's the reference for the everyday ethics cetacean stranding. Again, it's in in practice, and it's in every time, so at the back, so have a look, and uh, it'll just get you thinking about ethics and thinking about different problems that can come up, which is nice, just to see the problems that can come up, and also think about how to analyse them in the ways that we've been doing. It's, it's not rocket science. You do ethical analysis every day of your life, when you're working out what to tell your friend about what your other friend said. And <laughs> we're balancing interests all the time in our lives. We're just not doing it with a veterinary hat on. It's just a, it's just a case of it's like communication skills. You use them all the time, but you have to learn veterinary communication skills. Veterinary ethical reasoning is just the same thing. It's just a, applying knowledge you already have and skills you already have to this, this new subject. Okay, thank you. That's it. Any questions or comments? No? Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. There's still some party left, so you can go and... Thank you.